I'm going to introduce Catherine Hubbard, whose piece you're already all involved in, um, and Dylan Mira. And then when this is through, we'll just move back into the other room, and Dylan will do her thing, and then there'll be a proper break for hopefully some kind of nourishing amount of time. Um, the only other thing that I will say is that if you have something in your hand, like a beverage, that's cool if you keep it in your hand, but if you put it on the floor, put it well underneath your seat. Um, oh, you're right there, amazing, okay. So, um, okay, so Catherine, Dil uh, Catherine Dillon, yeah, pretty much. Catherine Hubbard and Dylan Mira um, are, uh, like without a doubt, two of my most challenging and rigorous interlocutors. I'm so happy that they're both here today and doing something kind of nearby one another, which is rad. Um, Catherine Hubbard's work increasingly invites in poetry, wordsmithing, questioning, resisting language and its limitations through insisting on the body, on light, and the writing that we do in spaces. And Dylan Mira's work offers a profoundly interwritten, entangled weave, drawing in threads that produce layers with turns of phrase that seem to question all that I know about the comfortable grammatical separations between subject and object. I save almost all of her emails because even simple one-liners about a meeting time or proposed activity fall into being poetry. I know that it can't be forced, that it has to come from the voice, and it can't be scheduled. And a series of thoughts have to build a series of inconsistencies set against the consistencies that are more familiar. And let's return to the possibility of the making of a photograph as an event, knowing that events are real and happen in time. Events cannot be planned for and cannot be predicted. And the event is the surprise and the exposure. Event from Latin, eventus, from e veneer, e plus veneer, meaning to happen. And the root of the Latin veneer is ven and vent having to do with things to come. As in, eventually, there might be an event, but we cannot know what the event will be, or we would negate the very possibility of the event. In some sense, thinking this way makes writing this text a kind of event. Writing without knowing what one will write about is an event of language. And the writing act is not so dissimilar from the speech act in this regard. Similar to speaking. So what I'm interested in is how Da writes about the impossibility of saying the event. And this has to do with the translation that occurs between the happening and the translation of that event into language that tells, explains, recounts, or regurgitates after the event has passed. As in, language refers to what has been. He speaks about iterability while I am thinking about photographic reproducibility. And the word, or any word, to be more clear, like the negative, is understood because of its endless reproducibility. Reproduction being the unfortunate route for communication and communication. And he speaks mostly about possibility and impact. Overwhelming sense that in order for anything to be possible, it must at first appear impossible and that the very possibility of being possible is predicated on its inherent impossibility. Though he states that the impossible is not negative 
or destructive. It only suggests that the impossible must be done. The impossible must be done. And in this case, he analyzes the Western mode of thought structure that defines the possible and impossible and suggests there is a more holistic way of considering the impossible as a necessary condition of the possible. Though the possible is always haunted by impossibility, and yes is always haunted by no, and then no is haunted by yes. And by these terms, I am considering how the haunting becomes the opening or the charge, or the unpredictable outside of the limitation of considering the haunting as a given structural spectrum. And Derrida says the haunting is absolutely essential. And to be more specific, the haunting is in the mind. It is some strain of thought that visits you regularly appearing unannounced and seemingly from the outside, unsummoned but appearing and appealing to the mind, an interruption from the past. And if it came from the future, you might refer to it as a vision. But the haunting is the thing you already know already experienced, already thought coming back to you, back on back to you again and again. And haunting is never referred to in the corporal sense because it always relies on this image constructed in the mind space and on language to be clear the iterability of the image, the speakability of the image, and a particular way threading the mind to the source of the haunting. But is piercing pain in the chest not a haunting? And is the twisted gut clenched into an anxious fist not a haunting? And are the shoulders taut with so much strain as to raise them visibly towards the ears, not a haunting? And are the exhaustive tears running rampant from the eyes after an orgasm, not a haunting? And are stiff limbs or parts deformed over years to reform in relation to some repetitive task not a haunting. And maybe the brick path in this case is the ghost. The loss of the image cutting the thread of iterability is the ghost. And maybe it's not the same event for everyone involved. Or maybe it is only an event for some. It certainly isn't the same image for everyone involved. And maybe the part of the problem is with any notion of universality and this strange safety net that we build by surrounding ourselves with sameness that assumes sameness in return. And maybe we should tread much more slowly in this sea to conserve energy. And maybe when we move the water more slowly, we will see the possibility of a puddle within this vast ocean. And if I was there, I would photograph from underwater and frame the legs from the knees down with a slow and long exposure, the egg beater kick alternating right and left, right and left, pushing downward with a kick that in turn lifts the body upwards with a buoyancy in salt water that is heightened by the seated position. In keeping the arms still so the puddle can emerge, avoiding a streamlined and straight 
rigid body of tensed muscles that immediately sinks downwards. And these images would be concerned with the motion that sustains a body. The position of survival and the kind of movement we are capable of at sea so distinctly different than the movement of survival on land. Still reliant on the knees, but knees flexed to run. And how many times has your survival been dictated by your capacity to do so? And at sea, we run slowly. And we run to stay in place, to stay as still as possible, and to float the body in a form of suspension. And how many times has your survival been dictated by your capacity to do so, to float the body? Eventually entering a state of torpor with the body temperature lowering and the slowing down things, the metabolism slowing and preserving the fat, and the legs kicking alternately right and left, right and left. And what does it mean to photograph from the inside of something? To photograph without any concern for the representation of the thing for how it looks, but a concern for a translation of the fundamentals, a concern for the translation of the ghost. When the camera performs, what happens when there is a release from the reliance on photographic iterability? And in this case, is it possible for the photographic print to become an event? Because I've been assuming the printed photograph cannot be an event because the image is always the documentation, not of the event of making the photograph in the first place, but like the iterative quality of language, the image becomes the reproducible and recognizable translation that attempts to tell or retell. So it becomes something else entirely new and separate from the event of its making. It becomes the story of what happened in the past brought forward every time it is looked at, but always suggesting what has passed, and that which has passed as in the past tense, implied by the photographic image, can never be the event, event being rooted in something to come. And when you're out there treading water in the puddle, treading water in the puddle, in the ocean. Metabolic arousal will summons you, if only temporarily, to warm you enough to glance up and catch a flock of white-bellied seagulls circling overhead. The light from the water reflecting brightly on their oiled, slick bellies, glittering like enormous flakes of snow circling like a storm cloud. And they're gone as quickly as they appeared. And what does it mean to come to performance from photography as opposed to coming to photography from performance? Because I didn't come here to tell you how you look once you're finished but I did come here to try out touching because I've been looking for so long, I almost forgot how to. Because photography will watch you drown in this puddle, in this ocean. The medium will watch you drown. And the performer may need the photographer to pay attention to them 
and see them. But the photographer needs performance, not the performer, to learn how to touch and to practice touch. And performance in this sense, as differentiated from the less consciously rendered performance of the everyday, becomes a kind of practice for touch. And then the camera is also touched differently in return and asked to touch back differently and embodied differently. And what happens to writing from this place when the urge to write and the urge to photograph were never that far off in the first place? So maybe grammar commas, slashes, etc., have no place in this composition. As Helen Molesworth suggests, we are replacing the either or logic with a logic of conjunctives and a new language of contingency. And the slowing down is so important. The torpor is so necessary just as the haunting is so present. And what kind of presentness occurs when things stay still, when the living, breathing, moving body consciously stays still, treading water so slowly as to suspend itself and commune with the body, holding the physical position of survival letting the external chatter fade and the ocean fade and the puddle fade. And it's all in the legs churning slowly and rhythmically. The presence is all in the legs. I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes for a minute. And just do a little check-in with your body, kind of feel where you're at. It's been a long day. Maybe you're really in your head. Maybe you're buzzy. Or maybe you're distracted by things happening outside of this space. And maybe those things are landing somewhere in your body. So just take a moment and kind of let yourself pass from your head down into your neck. Kind of slowly let yourself enter your chest. Notice your sternum. Take a minute to check in with your breathing. Find the places that feel really present, maybe in your calf muscles, because we've been sitting a lot. And I want you to take a minute and think about what are the things that feel like limitations right now. So when I say that word, limitations, where does that land you in your own body? And these can be really small things, rules, um, standards, things that you come up against. emotional limitations, physical limitations, right? But when I say that word, where do you land in your own body? And what I want you to do next is sort of imagine wherever you are in your body. I find often these things land kind of in the chest maybe in the gut, the kind of digestive tract, along the shins, places that are kind of buzzy, that hurt, ache, kind of. I want you to go ahead and imagine that thing as a physical form. 
So when I say that, I want you to kind of materialize this limitation into something tangible. So think about it, is it like dry and dusty? Is it really large? Or is it very small, something that can be really contained? Is it rubbery? Does it have a color? And once you've imagined that kind of physical form, I want you to go ahead and imagine with your own hands, sort of reaching inside of your body and wrapping your hands around this physical form. And I want you to imagine pulling it out of your body. So if it's really big, you might have to, you know, really put your back into it. Or if it's really dry and dusty, you might need to really cup your hands so you can hold it. Whatever it is, imagine yourself figuring out how to hold it. And then pulling it out of your own body. And I want you to go ahead and imagine yourself putting that underneath your chair. So whatever it is, it's just going to go under your chair. Maybe it doesn't fit, so figure out how to angle it, slide it under. If it really doesn't fit, you can just put it behind you. And next, I want to go ahead and um, think about the word likelihood. So again, these are really small things. What are the things that are likely to happen? And these can be things that are part of today's events. They can be things in your personal life, in your job world, in your work. But what are the things that are likely to happen, predictable? And again, when I say that word, I want you to really pay attention to where it lands in the body. Things that are likely to come. And I want you to go ahead and imagine that that likelihood has a physical form. So again, think about the material and the weight of it, the color of it, and the size of it. And go ahead and imagine again with your own hands, once you've located this likelihood inside of your body, and you've given it a form. Go ahead and reach inside and kind of wrap your hands around this thing. And once you feel like you have a really good grip on it, go ahead and remove it from the body. And you're going to put that under your chair as well. You can collect these later, so you don't have to remove them for forever. So if there's some resistance, it's totally OK. But you can have them back. And then I want you guys to think about the word haunting. So when I say that word, haunting, where does it land for you in the body? What are the first things that sort of come to you very immediately? Things that might be haunting you. And again, these can be very small things. And they can also be really big things.
But once you've found where that word is lodged in your body, I want you to go ahead and imagine it as a material form. So what does it kind of look like? Or what does it feel like? And where is it located? And how hard do you have to work to extract it? So once you've given it a physical form, again, I'm going to have you imagine that with your own hands, you're reaching inside of your body and wrapping your hands around the haunting in a way that lets you extract it. So once you have your hands around this thing, I'm going to have you pull it out and put it underneath the chair. And let's consider the rarity of touching, the politeness of acquaintance. But the knees are meeting and making some space. And in what ways are we all making some space for each other? Because we are all making space all the time and contorting the body to avoid contact or conflict. Here we are bodies in need of that touching, desperate actually for that exact contact we are avoiding or politely shifting ourselves in relation to. And I said I want more space, and I do. And I want more space for you. And I want more space for the person sitting next to you. And I want you to want more space for me. And maybe more space means less physical distance. So I want more space but less distance. And I want less distance for you and for the person sitting next to you. And I want you to want less distance for me. And face to face with you is hard. I don't know you, and here we are. Face to face, seeing your face and your eyes, seeing me back. The eye at times flitting away from contact or the contract, not a wandering eye traversing gently over the surface. Just please believe I am here to let you weep. I am here to make sure nothing happens to you, face to face held in the physical formation of respect and the physical of equal terms and the physical formation of reverence. Please believe I am here to let you weep. With bended knees exposed, the joint that allows you to stand vertically, with the body upright, to walk and run along the horizontal path, a term I love fight with the heels, fight with the heels for Middle English meaning to run away. And if you need to run, then go itchy calves. The impulse spares you from having to sit with the seeing eyes, seeing you. 
and back to back in the physical formation of protection. Between us, we expand our range of visibility, the physical formation of safety, the physical formation of cover. Just please believe I am here to let you weep up back to me so I can feel you. Just please believe to let you weep.